Good evening, and welcome to our midweek Bible study. I'm Pastor James Miller from the Trinity Christian Center in Beeville, Texas, and uh, thank you for joining me this evening for week 16 of our teaching series out of the book of Romans, titled The Righteous Live by Faith. <clears throat> and so I'm glad you could join me this evening, and I pray that you're uh, staying warm. I mean, it kind of hit us. We were in Abilene, and uh, we left here. It was like 78 degrees. Uh, in the morning, we get to Abilene Friday uh, afternoon, and it's like 38 or 42 degrees with a wind chill of 30-something. So uh, uh, it was a little brisk for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm praying that you all are staying warm. It looks like we're going to have uh, some cool weather for the rest of the week. At least the mornings are going to be cool, and the afternoons might be a little pleasant. And so uh, so I'm just glad to be back. and We got to spend time with our grandson and, our, and both of our other sons and our daughter-in-law. And uh, I was the comedy relief for, for this weekend because uh, we went and played disc golf with the boys. And so uh, I gave them quite a few laughs. Had to go through the thick brush to pick up my disc. And, uh, and the rules of golf are in disc golf are the same as regular golf. You play it where it lies. And so uh, it was pretty fun uh, and, and adventurous. But uh, God is good. Amen. Uh, last week, <clears throat> I taught concerning the law of wretchedness. Um, out of Romans chapter 7, uh, be, verses 7 through 25. And if you recall, if you, if you watch or if you caught it, um, if you recall, I stated that Jesus didn't abolish the law under grace. Uh, Paul was very clear of that in, in, in Romans. But instead, he fulfilled it. Even Jesus himself said that he did not come to do away with the law or abolish the law, but he came to satisfy it or fulfill it. And so as a result, the law continues to do what it was intended to do when God established it. See, since it wasn't removed, it wasn't done away with, and it wasn't abolished, and since it was fulfilled, it is still active. You know, and this is something that, that, that has been a tension because uh, people use it as, as a tool of legalism or as a something to beat people up with, and yet we don't have a clear understanding of the law's intent and how it continues to work even now under grace. And so what we, we, we learned last week was exactly that, that the law continues to do how, what God established it. That is to reveal the sinfulness of man. That was the intent of the law when God gave it to Moses. That is still the purpose of the law even now. It reveals the sinfulness of man or it reveals the sin that still provokes. And that's really what happens is sin in, in the man under grace provokes our human nature. Sin under the law is death. Okay, and that's the fundamental difference. Sin under the law demands death. Sin under grace will provoke our sinful nature to sin. But because we're under grace, we're no longer under death, if you recall that. So the law is not bad. Remember that we talked about the law is holy. I mean, it came from God. So the law is holy. The law is good. Right. And so the law is not bad because it still reminds us of our wretchedness in the sight of God. And some people think, oh, well, I'm not wretched. Well, all have sinned and fallen sh short of the, of the glory of God. Right. And so even now we still fall short of God's glory. But the difference is we're not condemned by the law. Right. But under grace, we could pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, repent and continue marching forward, okay? And so it reminds us of our wretchedness. We need to be reminded that in our human nature, we don't measure up to God's standard, right? And our wretchedness is, is, is foul in the sight of God. In the, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament, it says that it's a stench unto God. So we stink, you know, in our sinful nature, right? And so it reminds us of that. However, Here's one thing that, I, that in under grace that it reminds us that's more important. And this is what I want to focus on. Yes, we need to reflect in the mirror. We need to do a self-evaluation of, of, our, of our nature, making sure that we're dying to ourself, right? We're crucifying our, our, our flesh, not putting Christ back on the cross, but we're crucifying our flesh by denying ourselves and picking up our own cross each and every day. But here's what it more importantly reminds us. It reminds us of his love, right? We may be wretched, but his love right, is unconditional. We may be wretched, but his grace is more than enough. Amen. We may be wretched, but his mercy is fresh and new every day. And so that's what 
what it's supposed to remind us of, to continue to reveal that we have not been glorified, right? See, as long as we dwell in this earth, our human nature has not been glorified. Therefore, it will continue to sin. Yes, you and I will, will sin, even under grace, even saved in Christ Jesus, right? Our human nature has not been glorified, and so it will continue to sin until we are with him, until we are in his presence, until we are glorified and transformed, okay? I know that seems harsh, but the good news is, in grace, as we've learned, our, our past sin, our present sin, and our future sin is justified. We are sanctified and we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Romans 6 and 14, we talked about this several weeks ago. For sin will have no dominion over you. Say that. Sin has no dominion over me. Since you are not under the law, but under grace. Under grace, sin has no dominion, no power, no authority. Amen. And so, although the law will continue to reveal sin in us, it no longer defines us. We are not defined by our sin. Okay? It no longer separates us. We have been restored in our relationship and communion with the Father. And sin no longer condemns us in God's eyes. See, he no longer looks at us through his own eyes, but he looks at us through the filter of blood, Jesus's blood. He looks at us through the filter of the cross where Jesus hung on, on the tree. He became sin for us. He looks at us through the filter of the resurrection because now we were once dead and now we are alive in Christ. He looks at us through the filter of Christ's ascension. Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father now, making prayer and intercession for you and us. You and my, you and I. And he looks at us through the filter of the Holy Spirit because he poured out his Holy Spirit upon all flesh. Amen? And so that's the filter that God looks through when he sees us. He no longer looks at us through the law. He no longer looks at us through sin. He no longer looks at us through death. Man, that is good news. Amen? And so that leads us into tonight's lesson. And the subtitle for tonight is The Law of the Spirit of Life out of Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And so if you have your Bibles, um, go ahead and turn there. Um, if you don't have a, a paper Bible, try to find it online. Um, uh, the team's going to try to put it on, on the comment section. Uh, but it's Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Somebody should have shouted hallelujah. We'll, take, we'll continue though. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ who dwells in you. Amen. And so Roman, the, Romans 8 verse 1, right? The very first word when I said, as soon as you read that, someone should have shouted hallelujah. Okay. I want to read that one more time. Romans 8 verse 1. And I want you to read it out loud with me. Say the words out loud. Amen? You ready? There is therefore now, now, 
no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You should be professing and confessing and declaring that over your life. Especially, especially when we fall into temptation and when we fall into sin. God's grace is more than enough. We are not condemned. And this should be our declaration. Not as a license to sin, but acknowledging that in my sin, through my sin, out of my sin, I am not condemned because I belong to Christ. Someone needs to hear that tonight. Not only that, some of you need to get a dry erase marker and you need to write this on your bathroom mirror, right? There are times throughout throughout our marriage, Becky and I, we've done that. We've taken dry eraser markers and we've put declarations. We've written scriptures. We, we put professions on there. And, and when it kind of got too big, we put it on paper and we taped it to our mirror. Some of you need to write this down, right? Write it on your bathroom mirror. Put it in bold print on a piece of paper and tape it to your bathroom mirror. And every time you go to the bathroom and you look at that, you declare it with your mouth. Each and every time. Some of you need set free this evening. Some of you have been in bondage to condemnation because you continue to fall into sin and temptation. But I want to tell you tonight, you are not condemned. Amen? You are free in the name of Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are not condemned. All right? So I want to make this, make this not just a scripture, but make it personal. Okay? Make it personal. You should declare, I am not condemned in Christ Jesus. Put that on your mirror. Put that, put that on a piece of paper. Put it where you can see it. Put it on your refrigerator. Every single day, I am not condemned in Christ Jesus. That will set you free. So someone tonight or someone who watches this at a later date, You need to hear that. You need to declare that because God wants to set you free from legalism and the bondage of legalism, right? Because you are loved under grace by a merciful God, amen? And so throughout the last seven chapters of Romans and even chapter eight and going forward through the remaining book of Romans, This is the common theme. I mean, it's pretty much the common theme throughout all of Paul's writings. But he writes it just a little bit different to each one of the churches, right? But he states over and over and over how we're not under the law. We're under grace. We're saved by faith. (laughs) By grace, through faith. Oh my gosh. Continue over and over and over that we're not condemned under the law because Jesus satisfied the law. Paul continues to restate that to you and I, the church. So I want to make a statement here. Satan, the law, sin, people, humanity, in the church, outside of the church, even you and I, ourselves, and even God himself, no longer has the right, the power, or the authority to condemn us in Christ Jesus. Yes, I said that. Even God himself no longer has the authority or the power or the right to condemn us in Christ. Yikes, did some of you cringe? Because that's a pretty bold statement. But understand this, God cannot and he will not renege on his own word. That's why he won't go against it. That's why he can't condemn us in Christ. Because Christ became condemnation for us. You see what I mean? So God can't even go against his own word. He can't say, oh, you know what, man, James just continues to fall over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Does he not understand that my grace is sufficient? Does he not understand that it's not a license to sin? You know what? I'm just done with James. I'm going to take away his salvation. I'm going to remove grace. And I'm going to condemn him to hell. He can't do that. He sent Christ to do the finished work once and for all. And in Christ Jesus, it's satisfied. You see, he doesn't even look at sin in my life the same way he looked at it before I knew Christ Jesus. Did you hear that tonight? 
God doesn't even see sin in our life like he saw sin under the law. In Christ, he doesn't see sin. He doesn't see your sin or my sin. He sees Jesus. Did you hear that this evening? He sees Jesus in Christ Jesus. Us, for those of us who are in Christ, there is no condemnation, which means he does not see sin the same way in us like he saw it before. He only sees Jesus. Some of y'all need to be shouting hallelujah. You're getting some good word tonight. Someone needs to receive that. You see, the only thing that has more power and authority than God himself is God's word. Not only his spoken word, but the word that became flesh, which is Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus is the manifestation of God's spoken word. And that manifestation cannot be reneged. It cannot be taken back. What God said, it went and accomplished exactly what he said it would do. Oh, come on now. You, you got to receive that. The only thing greater than God is God's word. Christ. Hallelujah. Christ in you. Christ in me. Our hope of glory. Man, somebody grab a hold of that this evening, okay? I mean, I could stop right there, turn off the video, and we could be done. Because you got some, you got a truth this evening that will set you free if you receive it. Amen. But we still have about 14 minutes, so <laughs> we'll continue on. Let's reread Romans chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. Like I said, we could have stopped just on verse 1. 2 through 4. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I just said that, right? For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, I said that, right? He became sin on the tree. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We are the righteous requirement that's been fulfilled in Christ. It's fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We are free. You hear me? We are free in Christ Jesus. Free from God's wrath. Free from God's judgment. Free from God's condemnation. The law has no claim on you and I anymore. That means sin and death have no claim on you and I either. The law can't claim us. Sin can't claim us. Death can't claim us. We are free from wrath, judgment, and condemnation. The law can't condemn you anymore. Right? It's because it has been satisfied once and for all in Christ on the cross. So Paul's saying it's been satisfied. So he no longer condemns us. The law has no control over us. You see, because the law is bound to our flesh. To our, the, the law is bound to our sinful nature. And since we are no longer bound to our flesh, that's what it's saying. We're no longer walking according to the flesh, but we're walking according to the spirit. So therefore, the law that is bound to flesh and law that is bound to sinful nature, we are no longer bound to our own flesh. So the law is no, no longer bound to us, nor our sinful nature. Instead, we are now filled and led in freedom and liberty through the spirit of God. Okay? Now, I'm not referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight. It, it, it is a different context. But in Christ Jesus, we have the Spirit of God in us. A new spirit. A right spirit. One, one that, that, that has satisfied all things in Christ. Okay? The baptism of the Holy Spirit it is overlaid on top of that dwelling in us. Okay? So we're not talking about that tonight. When we receive salvation, we receive the Spirit of God, okay? The Spirit of salvation, the salvation uh, saving Spirit. So, like, we, that's what saves us, is our salvation faith saves us. And so we get a new Spirit. Jesus, Jesus said, I'll destroy the temple in three days, I'll restore it in the hearts of men. So in three days, when we die with Him and we are resurrected with Him, we are a new creation, okay? 
That new creation comes through the Spirit of God. So don't confuse that tonight with, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? The infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Spirit of God in Christ that is now in us because we believe by faith in Jesus, okay? And so <clears throat> we are no longer bound to that, but instead we are now filled and led in the freedom and liberty through the Spirit of God. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 17 through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay? So we are no... <clears throat> Sorry about that. I hope uh, I got a, a, a signal connection error, so I wanted to just pause and hopefully, hopefully you got the signal back. Okay. If you missed it, I'm just going to reread 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 again. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this clump comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. And so the, the, we have freedom and liberty now through the Spirit because we are no longer under the flesh. See, those of us who are in Christ have the Spirit of God in us. And we no longer walk in the flesh, but we walk in the Spirit. We walk in the freedom and liberty of the Spirit that dwells in us. Okay? Now, again, not talking about the baptism of the Spirit, the infilling and the empowering, okay? Okay? I'm talking about just the, the nature and the spirit of God in Christ that now is in us because we believed. Let's reread Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It is by the spirit that we now live. Amen. The spirit in Christ, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, one and the same. Okay. Not the Holy Spirit <coughs> as, as in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Right. And so. One and the same now dwells in us. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us in Christ Jesus. Amen? So we no longer walk in the law of the flesh. That's why we're no longer condemned. Okay? Because the flesh deals with sin and death. But we walk in the law of the spirit of life, which is the righteousness in Christ Jesus. You and I are that righteousness. Amen? As we talked about in the earlier earlier teachings of, of, of the book of Romans. When Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the law in his death and we died with him. This is why we have water baptism, the symbolic uh, 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 expression of being crucified with Christ and dying and being resurrected with him to life. Amen. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the law of death and we died with him. However, it was his resurrection by this same spirit that gives us life in him. See, had he not been resurrected, we would not be resurrected to life either. But he was resurrected to life and in him, we too have been resurrected into life. Man, that's amazing. It's hard to understand sometimes, right? And even Paul, sometimes he says, this is a mystery, but we understand all mysteries now. See, the resurrection of Christ is the greatest demonstration of God's sovereignty, authority, and power. We just thought creation was, was, was a great demonstration. We just thought that all the miracles through the Old Testament and the New Testament were great demonstrations of God's sovereignty. But the greatest demonstration of his sovereignty, his authority, and power was the resurrection of his Son, the Son of God and the Son of Man, one and the same. That is the greatest demonstration of God's sovereignty, authority, and power. And as a result, 
you and I, we now walk in the full anointing, the full authority, and the full power of Christ in the Spirit of God. That's what, that's what it means by the same power that raised him from the dead dwells in you. Now we, you and I, walk in the same anointing, authority, and power that the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Oh, that, that is the law of the Spirit of life. Amen? And so, Jesus not only became sin on the cross, okay? He conquered sin and death in his resurrection. This is why it is so important for us to understand sin has no mastery over us in Christ. Say that with me. Say, sin has no mastery over me in Christ Jesus. Death has been defeated in Christ. Say, death has been defeated in my life in Christ Jesus. The law has been fulfilled in Christ. Say, the law has been fulfilled in me in Christ Jesus. God's wrath and judgment is satisfied in Christ. God is not mad at you. God is not angry with you anymore. God is not, is not looking to pour out wrath. He's not looking to, 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 to pass judgment on you or condemn you anymore because it is satisfied in Christ. We are not condemned in Christ. Say it. I am not condemned in Christ Jesus. <laughs> we are the righteousness of God in Christ Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are the fruit of God's love, grace, and mercy in Christ. You and I, as Christ bore the marks of the cross and was resurrected into glory, you and I bear those same marks in his death and in his resurrection. We are now the church, God's love, grace, and mercy in Christ Jesus to the world and to our generation. What does that mean? I can sum it up in this last statement. We have the victory. Everything that I just stated, everything that, that Christ accomplished in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, right? Everything, we have the victory in this life and in this generation in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'll close with this scripture. And hopefully I didn't lose you or I'm not breaking up. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 through 57. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that we have victory over sin and death. We have victory over condemnation. We have victory over God's wrath and judgment. We have victory over our flesh, our sinful nature. We have victory over Satan. <laughs> we have victory over heaven and earth. We have victory over all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you this evening. Thank you, Father. This was a short word, but a very powerful message that we are not condemned in our flesh anymore. We are not condemned in our sin anymore, but we are alive because the Spirit of, of Christ lives and dwells in us. Your Son satisfied all of this in His finished work, and we are now benefactors <laughs> in Your love, grace, and mercy. And Father, I just pray that those that needed to hear this this evening and those that will hear this at, at a later date, Father, I pray that they receive it. And I pray, Father, that it breaks the strongholds in their life, that the chains that have kept them bound, Father, that they break loose and they disintegrate all around them. And every hindrance that has been hindering them because of condemnation, will be removed because they are set free and they are at liberty in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you and I just praise you for each and every person who's watching and who will watch. That, Father, that they have ears to hear and hear what you have spoken this evening. For your word has gone forth 
and it will accomplish exactly what you sent it to do in each and every one of our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray you did receive that tonight. And those of you that have been struggling with condemnation in your life, you're free. You're free. God doesn't condemn you. Christ doesn't condemn you. No man can condemn you. Satan can't condemn you. You are free and you have the victory. Amen. Thank you for joining me this evening. So be sure to join us this Sunday, November 1st at 10 a.m. for our in-person celebration gathering. I'm excited. Um, I've had a couple Sundays off and, and I'm refreshed. It was Pastor Appreciation Month in October. And so I'm excited about a new series that I'm going to begin this Sunday titled Unshaken. And so you don't want to miss this. And uh, also, <laughs> very important, remember, Daylight Savings Time ends this Sunday morning at 2 a.m. So don't forget to set your clocks one hour back, okay? One hour back before you go to bed on Saturday. And if not, if not, that's okay. Because some of you might be early to church for the very first time. Don't hate me. That was a joke. But I love you. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Amen. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday.